On a June day in 2005, at the Olympic Stadium in Athens, the world record on the 100 meters were broken. People were shocked. Not because the world record had fallen, but more because it was a totally unknown man who smashed it. The guy's name was Asafa Powell, a 22-year-old Jamaican sprinter. Only three years earlier, Asafa Powell was just another Jamaican teenager wandering about in Kingston, Jamaica, trying to find a place to train. His best time for the 100 meter was far from impressive and he was rejected by almost all colleges in Jamaica. Nobody believed in his potential. So it was also a mixture of surprise and wonder that was left hanging in the summer air over the Olympic Stadium in Athens on this June evening in 2005. How could an unknown Jamaican develop in just a few years from a mediocre sprinter to the fastest man on the planet? Well, it turns out that Asafa Powell's story is not an exception at all. Speak with business leaders, sports coaches, music teachers and scientists all over the world and they all have their own Asafa Powell story to tell. Stories about people who were overlooked but turned out to be superstars. Let me give you a few examples. Ronaldo, the Brazilian soccer player who was named as the world's best three times. When he was 15 years old, the biggest Brazilian soccer club Flamengo refused to pay Ronaldo's bus ticket from his home to the training ground. A return ticket was priced less than a dollar. Another example is Michael Jordan, the world's best basketball player ever, who was cut from his high school team at the age of 16. Richard Branson. As many other of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, Branson is dyslexic and was in his early life categorized as a low performer in school. Or take Paul McCartney, who went through his entire education without anyone noticing he had any musical talent at all. It seems like that mastering the art of talent identification is an extremely tough discipline. And the harsh truth is that the vast majority of the talent ID programs out there are no better than drawing lots. As Capital One CEO Richard Fairbank has said, at most companies people spend 2% of their time recruiting and 75% of their time managing their recruiting mistakes. And in retrospect, we laugh at the soccer coaches who refuse to pay Ronaldo's bus ticket, the music teacher who overlooked Paul McCartney, and the college coaches who rejected Asafa Powell time after time. How can you overlook the potential of world-class performers like them? An easy way to understand why we mess up talent identification is to separate performance from potential. Imagine a matrix like this. The x-axis assesses potential. How good can a person become in the future, short-term as well as long-term? The y-axis assesses current performance, the result that a person delivers here and now. Let me give you an example. Usain Bolt, the fastest man on the planet and the guy who ended up beating Asafa Powell's world record. Bolt is one of those people who was spectacular even in childhood. Already at the age of 13, he was predicted to be the man who would set new standards in the sprint distances. In our metrics, people like Bolt are categorized as high performers and high potential. Usain Bolt is an example of what you would call a shouting talent. Asafa Powell, on the other hand, demonstrated nothing extraordinary in his early performances. Even at age 18, his performance was really average. The same was true for Paul McCartney, Ronaldo and Michael Jordan. For some reason, their potential did not manifest in current high performance. They're all examples of what you could call whispering talents. And that's just the point. How do you find potential in something that looks ordinary at the moment? How do you spot a superstar who is not yet a superstar? For the past year, I've been traveling around the world to study the world's most successful talent and performance environments. My conclusion is that by understanding three simple lessons, everyone can dramatically improve their ability to spot talent. And the first lesson is to understand that great talent is not necessarily right talent. 
Take the NFL, the American Football League, which is known to be creme de la creme of talent identification science. Every year in April, the so-called NFL Scouting Combine is held in Indianapolis. It's a sort of a mini camp where NFL coaches and managers meet to assess North America's 300 best college players. They get them tested in every aspect of the game, how high they can jump, how much weight they can lift, how fast they can run, and so on. One of the most famous tests at the Scouting Combine is the Wonderlic Intelligence Test, which is used to test potential quarterbacks. To be a quarterback in the NFL, you have to possess well-developed cognitive skills and to be a quick, confident decision maker. And the idea is that how well you do in an intelligence test will give the managers a very accurate picture of your potential as a quarterback in the NFL. The problem is just that among the seven players noted for the worst performances, in the Wonder League test in the history of the NFL scouting combine, we find two of the best quarterbacks ever, Terry Bradshaw and Dan Marino. In other words, a good performance in the Wonder League test might indicate some kind of talent, but it's certainly not the talent you need to become a quarterback in NFL. It's not the right talent. And my point is that if you're not crystal clear on what are the critical competence driving success in a given job, you'll simply be looking for the wrong talent and you will cut off people who has real potential. The second lesson is to understand that what you see is not necessarily what you get. Let's say you have a 15-year-old sprinter running 10.2 on the 100 meter and another 15-year-old sprinter running 10.6. Who would you put your money on? Everything seems to be screaming at you that you should choose the one who runs 10.2. But if you're good, you will have enough experience to know that the guy who ran the distance in 10.6 may have an even greater potential. Imagine, for instance, that the 10.2 guy did have the best coaches in the country. He's coming from a very professional and qualified training environment. And on top of that, he's, despite of his young age, already fully physically developed. The 10.6 guy, on the other hand, has a story similar to Asafa Powell's. He basically trained on his own, not in a structured way at all, and he's a late developer physically. With that knowledge in mind, the 10.6 guy might be a much better bet than the 10.2 guy. Or put it in another way, a raw 10.6 could be better than a trained 10.2. My point is that if you're going to say something qualified about people's potential, you must understand that what you see is not necessarily what you get. It is not only the result that counts, it's the story behind it that counts. The same is true in business. Results can be affected by many external factors. Luck often plays a huge role. Market conditions, unique circumstances, pure randomness, bad or good bosses. Again, Don't judge potential using numbers alone. Dig below the surface to learn how the numbers were achieved or what stood in the way of achieving them. If you do this, you will realize that someone that looks ordinary on the surface might be your next world-class performer. The third lesson is to understand that we should never, ever overrate certificates and never, ever underrate character. Last year, I visited the world's, without doubt, most successful athletics club, the MVP track and field club in Kingston, Jamaica. At the Beijing Olympics in 2008, MVP's eight athletes brought home nine medals. And before going to MVP, I had an image in my mind of a first-class speed college with room service and a spa section with laid-back reggae streaming out of the loudspeakers. But no... MVP track and field club is nothing but a diesel scorched grass field. No high-tech test equipment, no cutting edge fitness center, not even an athletic tracks. Just a pile of cones, a stopwatch, some rusty old weights in a gym with no air conditioning. But despite the huge success, head coach of MVP Stephen Francis has absolutely no intention of changing anything. As he told me, 
A performance environment should not be designed for comfort, but for hard work. Stephen Francis uses the Spartan conditions to test his sprinters and to identify factors that you cannot read from a certificate, know from a psychological profile analysis, or ask your way to in a job interview. Factors like, why are you here? Are you driven by feeling good or getting better? And how much do you really care? As Stephen Francis says, the most important thing a man has to tell you is what he's not telling you. And I'm not saying that you should downgrade facilities. I'm just saying that success is not about facilities or fancy certificates. It's first and foremost about mindset. Once some basic level of competence is present in people, the key question stops being what can you do today? Instead, it becomes what can you learn tomorrow and what are you willing to do for it? So finding undervalued talent is not easy, but it's possible if you understand that great talent is not necessarily right talent, that what you see is not necessarily what you get, and that character is much more important than certificates. After all, no one wants to walk past the next Asafa Powell.